of the key collaborative relationships within research infrastructures is how the digital research infrastructure project or how the research infrastructure itself works with the traditional knowledge infrastructures, the collections holdings institutions. So I suppose one of the first questions one might ask is that, well, if museums, libraries and archives already exist, why do we need research infrastructures doing things with similar kinds of source material, sim similar kinds of data? And I would say that one of the most important aspects to the answer to this question, but also one of the most important aspects to the, um, to the understanding of this dynamic between the, the digital researcher infrastructure and the traditional knowledge infrastructure, the collection holding institution, is this set of slightly different goals and a set of problems that arise in this relationship, which with awareness and some investment, we can actually work better to, to, to address. So the sources of culture clash within and between research infrastructures and cultural heritage institutions, I would say there's about five different problems. Um, one being the goals, the mission and motivations, which are different. One being a question of data and metadata. The third being uh, the differences in digital preparedness. The fourth being one of structures, hierarchies, and knowledge organization frameworks. And finally, the big one of risks and trust. So I'm going to go through these in some detail. First of all, this first problem which I call the researchers are from Mars and librarians from Venus problem. And being myself trained as a scholar of the 19th century German uh, canon, I, I, I think back to the famous German historian of the 19th century, Leopold von Ranke. And for me, he kind of really clarifies the way the historian wants to view the world and his, in this case, sources. So his claim to fame was that he felt that his goal and his achievement would be to write history as it actually was, as if he could recreate the, the events through his analysis and interpretation. And what I find really interesting in thinking about Ranke and how Ranke stands for me as, as an example of the historical method, almost at a slightly parodied level, but um, that may help us see the differences a little more, is that at the same time, working in a different country, was Antonio Panizzi, um, you know, the, the kind of the classic librarian's librarian, uh, who wrote a wonderful treatise called The 91 Rules to be Observed in Preparing and Entering Titles. And his claim to fame was denying the historian Thomas Carlyle access to uncatalogued materials, which many of my historian colleagues look at and say, hmm. So what do these two examples tell us? First of all, that really the historian and the information specialist have goals that run in parallel, but sometimes come into conflict. So for the historian, there's an emphasis on the veracity, the completeness, the accessibility, the comprehensibility of sources. Because what the historian then does is brings them together, verifies them, and uses them to create this required or desired record of events in the past. Um, the historian is driven by usually a research question, underpinned by an idea of academic freedom. And his incentive is to make this broad intellectual content or context clear uh, that underpins and draws together the sources. Now, the information specialist on the other side is looking at the provenance, the completeness, the material condition of the sources, because the information specialist wants to make sure they are going to be available and discoverable. So to preserve them, to make them usable. And the information specialist is driven largely by existing or developing collections that exist around him or her, and is sometimes limited by resources or indeed by an institutional mission. For example, many national libraries would have a national mission, so they wouldn't necessarily be empowered to collect beyond that, that national frame. Now, this didn't used to be a particular problem. If you imagine, there are a number of different institutions the researcher walks in through the door of one and enters into that system, becomes a, 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 visitor, a visitor, a traveler within that culture. And as all of us know, as travelers across cultures, when you're in a culture, you can adapt. But once we get into that um, sense of there being a, a federated place, a place where all of this comes together, not only the researcher culture and the cultural heritage institutional culture, but the library, the archive, the museum culture, which can themselves be quite distinct. So the digital is pushing these together and in ways that are 
emphasizing a culture clash, which may have been there a long time, but which didn't have an arena to be fought out. So the second problem I mentioned was data, metadata, and licenses. And we have a little movie elsewhere in this set of materials about uh, data and metadata, so I encourage you to take a look at that. But one of the things you'll notice working in a research infrastructure is that everyone in a research infrastructure wants data. And everybody means something different with this word. It's one of those key words that has a tendency to have completely different definitions depending on where you are in the landscape. So for some people, well-formed, internally coherent metadata is the gold standard. Others would like a clean, machine-readable, structured or unstructured set of text. And others would like meaningfully transcribed full text of original sources. So what you're looking for, what you mean when you use the word data, is all the all of a sudden going to be a problem, again, when you're trying to bring different people together and when you're trying to bring different data sources together. And everybody says, well, I need the data. I gave you the data. Well, I need the data. I gave you the data. If the two words, if the single word is meaning something different in each case, then you're going to have a problem. And of course, metadata. Um, elsewhere, I will have talked about the importance of using standards. But anyone who knows anything about standards will know which one. Um, and this is just a list of some of the ones that I have encountered. Um, everything from the metadata standards you use to describe uh, collections, all the way through to the metadata standards you might use to describe aspects of a text, to ISO codes that are used to describe standard things out in the world, like the two-letter codes for countries, all the way through to different vocabularies and different um, linked open data resources that may have specific uh, places in the environment. There's so many of these and they do change and unfortunately we humans have a tendency to address a lack of standardization not by saying oh gosh there are so many competing standards let's actually resolve on one. Well of course that resolving on one usually requires the creation of an independent standard and of course then you end up with 15 competing standards rather than the 14 you had before. So the whole idea of trying to find ways of converging, of working within a standardized environment in terms of describing data and metadata, which we can't agree what it means anyway, um, is another thing where individual communities are going to have individual commitments and, and the sense that certain standards are stronger than others. So this is another place where we can find divergence in, in, in opinions where we need people kind of coming together. So. We're going to have problems there, and again, there are lots of resources out there to help understand how within a research infrastructure you can actually approach data and metadata in a, a, a responsible and informed sort of way without just making one more standard. Um, so some projects will document their, their metadata uh, approach. Um, others will actually create resources like the Parthenos Standard Survival Kit, which I would very, very heartily um, refer you to if you're looking to find a standard that will work for you for really just about anything. Um, there are uh, projects like the Mint tool, uh, which actually helps align different standards. And of course, there's things like OpenRefine, which can help you to um, clean up data once you've aggregated it together. So there's lots of places to go to try and overcome these difficulties in discourse. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that you're unlikely to find them, certainly at the beginning of a relationship. And one of the things that's quite difficult is that pushing forward or, or, or figuring out how to push out data is something that actually really challenges cultural heritage institutions because this is what the research infrastructure is often encouraging them to do, to say, look, if you share your data with me, I can aggregate that data with others and that could be more meaningful for a historian, for example, who doesn't want to work in a national context but a transnational context. But this idea of trying to get a cultural heritage institution to not only see their data as something that should be just open, but open and inside out, that is able to be taken uh, and reused by other projects, by other individuals, um, this is quite difficult. So um, a couple of key rules we've developed or a key ad a bits of advice we've developed for talking to cultural heritage institutions about the value of reusable standards. Um, some of them will actually see it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it is, in many ways, the right thing to do. This is really we're realizing that data silos don't serve us. They don't serve knowledge creation. Uh, and the idea of having this kind of five-star open data is something that is, is a good in itself and will serve 
in generic ways going forward. Um, but also when you look at the data deluge, about how much data is out there, there's only so much data we are going to be having a human capacity to describe and to work with. So actually making data open makes it more accessible to those who might use it, um, which in a situation where there is so much data might actually be able to help it meet a user who can, who can actually access it and, and enhance it and use it for knowledge creation. Um, of course, one of the other good reasons for using, uh, for, for making your data open is because once your data is open, it's actually much easier to federate your data with that of others. So it's a kind of a give to get scenario where all of a sudden, if you are able to work in an open environment, you can better use things like DBpedia or um, the, the, the resources that have been brought together by other platforms and other uh, projects. Um, Certainly the question of it being what a user wants is a compelling one. And I did mention the example of transnational history. This is um, one of the, the, the large new uh, histories of the First World War, which is really very much based on this transnational set of questions. And if you look at those questions, no single question can be answered in that entire set of three volumes from a perspective of a single archive. Um, they're simply not national questions, and they're not even regional questions. They're questions of social history, of people's lives. Um, Another reason why it's very useful in talking to cultural heritage institutions to um, help them uh, understand what it means to share their data, another useful argument is that they will gain an impact and visibility. Um, it's one of the, the, the great paradoxes, I think, of digital data, is that in some ways making something available externally is something that increases demand for it. It increases visibility, and of course, every cultural heritage institution wants to make a mission of actually making heritage open. And finally, one of the other um, uh, sets of conversations that you can have with a cultural heritage institution is the way in which if you're structuring along agreed standards, if you're using agreed definitions of data and metadata, it will also help structure the processes within your own institution. And that will be good for the institution over the long term. It will make you better able to access larger networks, but also be, be better able to access the kind of professionalism and the kind of professional help that might assist an archive going forward. So I mentioned as one of the problems sort of differing degrees and differing attitudes towards digital data and towards data generally. Um, and there's just, to give you a, 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 a kind of a synopsis of this, um, there are many archives, and I, I mentioned the, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and the Imperial War Museum as two that I've encountered, where they have very, very well-catalogued, well-prepared, well-preserved digital data that is available for users to access and do with what they please. And that's a very exciting thing to encounter. But then you have other archives. Many in Eastern Europe are like this. I'm thinking of the Hungarian State Archives, but also it could be the Romanian or any other, um, where you would have, because of material resource concerns or because of uh, political reasons, be, for whatever reason you will find that the level of digitization is much lower, the level of cataloging may be lower, the level of conservation may be a challenge. And so all of these differences, these sort of gaps between even within cultural heritage institutions, even within that sector, you'll find huge differences in the online presence, in the standardization, in the organizational capacity, um, in the political orientation towards openness, in the levels of tacit versus open knowledge, or individual versus institutional control over access. All of these issues can be greatly varied. Now, why is that important for a research infrastructure? If you're trying to gather up data on a particular topic, if you want to be the reference point for that for, your, for a set of scholars, does that mean for you that it's more important to work with the well-exposed archives? Or is that actually a, almost a threat to your ability to deliver? Because the, the, the gravity of these larger archives, of these very well-prepared, often Western European or, or Western general archives, it's sometimes hard to resist that. You pull the data in, it's easy to get, you have it, you can do cool things with it. Does that mean that the data in these other less well-resourced, less well-prepared archives is less important? Absolutely not. So it becomes a challenge to make sure that you're walking a proper line in federating information and bringing things together and using the data and working with 
the institutions that have the capacity to be good partners without actually allowing that to change the level of what you're doing, without allowing that to twist the, the, the perspective you're, you're um, enabling on the content that you deliver. So it's a challenge, but it's one that you can, you can approach. And there will be as many different ways of approaching that as there will be archives as there will be cultural heritage institutions. So this is just another set of, of um, institutions I've had the pleasure of working with over, over the past many years. Um, some of them, for example, if you're looking to use data from Europeana, it's fantastic because they have a RESTful API and a CC0 license. You go in, you pull it, you reuse it. It's easy. Um, now, that isn't necessarily saying that the data in Europeana is the best data for you to use or that it's the richest data you can find, but it is easy to access. Now, things like the Archives Hub UK, they have an OAI PMH uh, endpoint and a CC BY license, so slightly more restriction on it, but again, once you get the processes in place, you can access that data very easily. Others, like the Instituto Centrale per gli Archivi, um, has a linked open data Sparkle endpoint, which is again very useful for certain kinds of data, it brings it in in a certain format. The Rafs Archive in Estonia, uh, allows it all for download. You just just transfer the files down. It's all CC0 or CC by SA. Um, then, however, on the other hand, I did mention these other kinds of archives. You have the Museo Storico della Guerra in Rovereto, and they have basically nothing. Um, the best uh, way I can advise if you want to pull data out of that particular archive and use it in a digital format is that you go there with your computer. Uh, literally, there are many, many, especially these small regional archives, it doesn't mean their data is less important for what we want to understand. It just means that working with them is going to have a, a bigger challenge. And of course, there's other ones like the, the JDC archives in the US um, where they have a, 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 are they able to facilitate a web dev um, transfer, but they're very clear that they want a non-commercial license on it. All of these things are going to come into play if you're working with different cultural heritage institutions. And for every institution, there has been a set of choices as to why they want to use these particular formats and have these particular protocols in place, why they want to have this kind of sharing attitude. Um, and if you're building a research, arc a research infrastructure, you're going to have to learn to negotiate through these. And part of negotiating through these, um, it, it's, it's interesting that you find that, again, different cultures in a research infrastructure, there are often people who are able to speak about the data and also able to speak about the scholarly impact and who can actually move forward. Um, I think generally in research infrastructures, because oftentimes they're driven by project money and they have a set of deliverables and they have to get them out the door, tends to be a certain amount of empowerment. However, in cultural heritage institutions, there's sometimes a disconnect. Again, a larger institution with a potentially national mission. Um, you often need to talk to not only an archivist who would understand um, the collections or a librarian who would know what actually the relevant material is, but you also need to talk to a technical person because the, the level of dialogue between the technical systems and the human systems may be low. And also, again, some of these institutions will be quite hierarchical, so you may also need the person who can say yes or no to actually cooperating with you. And this moving up and down the layers of hierarchy is another thing that is potentially surprising if you're coming from a different development culture, but something that will be quite necessary if you want to have an easy relationship with culture heritage institutions. And all of this, of course, comes down to a question of trust. And I'm gonna tell you a secret. The cultural heritage institutions do not trust the new form of research infrastructure. So these are some of the things you're going to have to assure them of, of if you are having a conversation, for example, about data sharing or about collaboration with a cultural heritage institution. First of all, they're going to want to know, what is this going to cost me? Because many of them, public institutions, not always in um, very, very well-funded systems for culture, uh, they're not necessarily going to want to divert their funds and their people into delivering something that is really more your goal. So first of all, they're going to want to know the resource implications. But they're also going to want to know the data longevity. These are the preservers of data. They will want to know what's going to happen and how are you going to make sure that this remains accessible for the long term. Um, they're going to want to know about potential data reuse, potential data abuse, and what's the profit model. Um, 
in spite of the fact that most of these institutions would not necessarily be in a place to start a profit-making endeavor on the back of their data, they would be very suspicious of someone who might do that. Um, and more than anything else, they're very suspicious of the possibility that this data might get exposed, might get reused in a way that would harm someone, either someone living or the family of someone living, or that would harm someone indirectly. So this idea that data, when aggregated, can somehow be more harmful, that somehow there's a thing that they don't understand that they won't have control of, um, is, a, is a real barrier sometimes to collaborations and one that needs to be discussed openly. Um, they're going to want to know what your licensing is going to be like. Um, they may be uncomfortable with CC0. Um, they may be uncomfortable with CC0 for certain kinds of data, uh, but this is something you need to be prepared to have an open conversation with them about. And also, offering back the transformations. If you're doing translations, if you're allowing um, uh, additions of, of crowdsourced information, making sure that you know whether or not there is a good way of sharing that data back with them. It's good for your sustainability, but it's also good for their, um, for their data richness. And finally, credit. How are you going to make sure that anyone who uses data within your research infrastructure is going to know where it came from, going to understand the provenance of it, and be able to track that back to the institution it came from. Um, this is going to be quite important. Now, just to, to, to give you a bit of a sense of how one project dealt with these questions, um, certainly from the terms of resources, we asked for minimal effort in the Sindari project from the cultural heritage institutions. We simply could not see a way of asking them to invest in what was, again, our goal, and that they wouldn't necessarily be able to see as, as serving their institution until very far down the road. Um, we had a memorandum of understanding with the Daria Research Infrastructure about maintaining that data into at least a five-year window beyond the project, so a total of a nine-year window, and they were able to see that and understand the meaning of that. Um, we had a very clear data agreement and a very clear data license that said what the reuse terms were. We supported a CC BY license, um, which we felt was the most reasonable license for scholarly work. but. We also opened a, a, a flexible window, so if there were partners that really wanted something different, they would be able to have that in the metadata. Um, there was no barrier on our side to sharing transformations back, and we made sure that that was very clear. And then finally, within that um, environment of credit, we did use the CC BY, but we also had frequently asked questions and checklists and workflows to make sure that there was always a pointer back and that there was always an awareness that this wasn't our own owned data within the Sindari project, that it was more something that was given to us so that we could federate it, so that then it could be shared back, and that the information and the, the requests for knowledge, the search for knowledge, could go back to the sources where, where necessary. So there are uh, ways in which um, this conversation between the cultural heritage institutions and the research infrastructures is becoming easier. Uh, and certainly with the move towards open science and open access, I think we're going to see more and more pressure in the system to align these two ways of seeing the, the, the cultural data world. Um, as the cultural data is research data, if we are required in the future to deposit research data, then we're actually going to find a requirement there that we can draw the data out of the cultural heritage institutions and um, allow it to be associated with our, our research outputs. So that's one thing that I think will help. But really, um, there's changing paradigms all over the place. It's a really interesting time to be looking at this relationship between the research infrastructure and the cultural heritage institution. Um, because first of all, um, the availability and the usage of APIs is growing. So I could foresee a situation where in a few years' time we'll have every library looking seriously at whether having an op open API is something they want to look into, whether researchers are actually going to access that directly, or whether there's going to be a class of intermediaries able to facilitate that use. Um, we're seeing lots more use of scraper technologies, so even if you are making your your institution's data available only in an institutional silo, I might still be able to pull that in and federate it like for like with other data. However, there are ethical questions around this, and of course questions are open in Europe as to whether the right to read is the same as the right to mind. Um, and finally, we have these questions about historians wanting the idea of big data. Researchers are looking at 
all that digital data out there, all these big data approaches, you know, big data being the secret to living happily ever after. Um, but the historians aren't necessarily on a trajectory to get that. So the question is, if we can't provide big data approaches to cultural heritage information, well, what are we going to end up with? What will the environment look like? Um, you know, so, so how do we digitize and contextualize enough? How do we find the new stories there? How do we give the, the user a sense of the completeness the, the sort of the edges of a collection. Um, how do we resist the fact that um, really the historian has always been one to take data and turn it into narrative, and now we're taking narrative and turning it into data. How do we get that environment to work properly? How do we make sure that provenance is still rich and that the tacit knowledge of the archivist or the librarian is present in these new systems? How do we invent new and hybrid models of, of augmented information retrieval. That means that we don't have white lights where there has been investment and black holes where there hasn't been. How can we have a, have a kind of an even grayscale across that? These are all parts of the environment that's changing fast. And I, I would be optimistic that as this environment changes, we'll find that dialogue, that collaboration between the traditional cultural heritage institutions who bring so much strength uh, to the, the long-term success of the research in the arts and humanities, and these new research infrastructures who are actually helping to harness new methodologies. I think we'll see that actually gain new strength as the pressures come in, but that's one that's yet to be seen.